This episode of Legal Eagle was made possible by Skillshare. Learn to think like a lawyer for free for two months by clicking on the link in the description. Authorities say that the El Dorado forest fire that is currently burning out of control in California was started at a gender reveal party when a couple detonated a smoke-generating pyrotechnic device to announce to the world that their unborn baby was a son. The device ignited the four-foot-tall grass at the El Dorado Ranch Park on a day when most of California was being roasted by temperatures of over 100 degrees. So far, thousands if not millions of acres have burned allegedly as a result of this gender reveal party. Hundreds of firefighters are battling the blaze and thousands of people have had to evacuate. So congratulations, it's a fire. And because we live in the dumbest timeline, gender reveal parties have actually sparked at least four disasters, including two forest fires, a plane crash, and a person killed by what was effectively a pipe bomb. Seriously, why do people do this? Why do they think it's a good idea? But this raises a different legal question. Shouldn't the people whose actions start wildfires be held responsible for the damages to life and property? Well, the El Dorado blaze was just one of several fires that continued to burn up and down the West Coast as extreme heat created hazardous conditions. And therein lies the first of many problems in assigning blame and recouping costs. Here, allegedly, a couple started a fire, but how do you decide if they have liability? And if so, when millions of acres burn, where does their liability end? And who normally pays for damages caused by massive fires? And finally, if billion dollar fires are more common because of climate change, how will the law rise to meet this challenge? Hey, Legal Eagles, it's time to think like a lawyer because we didn't start the fire. It was always burning since the world's been turning, but thanks to climate change, it's burning a whole lot more often. And in that situation, who pays for the damages caused by these massive, massive wildfires that are currently burning California and Oregon? And in general, there are probably three main sources that are likely to provide compensation in a situation like this with forest fires. One is insurance companies, though that's increasingly becoming less likely to pay for uh, circumstances like these. Two is the federal government. In other words, taxpayers are likely to pick up the bag when insurance companies uh, refuse to. And then third, of course, are other people, people that are responsible for the fires or people that contribute to the fires and potentially people who contribute to global warming. Well, fires are as old as civilization itself and as a result, we've developed a number of legal tools to help deal with the liability that's caused from those conflagrations. And if you know your American history, you might recall that Mrs. O'Leary and her cow were blamed for the Great Chicago Fire of 1871, which killed 120 people, consumed over three square miles of the city center, and caused $200 million in damages in today's money. Eventually, historians concluded that she was the victim of anti-immigration sentiment, and the city formally exonerated her in 1997. But similarly, in 2017, Rita Yeboa, a Ghanaian immigrant, was blamed for the deadly Bronx apartment fire that killed 13 people. Her three-year-old son was playing with the oven when it caught fire, and Yeboah was chastised by local authorities for not attending to her son and failing to close the door. These two stories have more in common than just anti-immigration sentiment. There's no doubt that the Chicago fire was started in Mrs. O'Leary's barn, just like there was no question that the deadly Bronx fire was started in Yeboah's apartment. But Mrs. O'Leary disputed the idea that she had negligently milked a cow, which allegedly kicked over a lantern and started the blaze. And similarly, Yeboah fought back by suing her landlord for permitting dangerous conditions in the apartment apartment building, which may have had doors that wouldn't stay closed. Although both women faced social stigma, neither of them had to pay for the damages to property or the cost of fire suppression. And that's because in America, fires that weren't intentionally set by arsonists have historically been treated as, well, accidents. However, in 2020, massive wildfires are frighteningly commonplace, and they're taxing our traditional methods of paying for them. And we'll get to the personal liability that stems from causing fires, as in what happens when you get sued for causing a fire in, in just a second. But let's start with the more traditional way that people get uh, compensation for accidents, especially when it comes to homes and fires, which is the insurance industry. And for those who are uninsured or underinsured, FEMA offers individual and household disaster assistance that can help pay for damages to homes and businesses. Generally, we're talking about standard homeowners policies, the insurance policy that everyone needs when you buy or own a house, which generally covers destruction and damage caused by a fire, which generally includes wildfires. In the event of a fire, the insurance company will pay to rebuild or repair an insured home and remediate smoke damage. This includes the outbuildings on the property, such as a garage or a tool shed. Some insurance policies cover theft or vandalism that happens in the event of looting in the wake of a wildfire. Businesses tend to have their own policies, which cover fire damage to the building, office space and equipment and inventory. And of course, insurance is an important piece of the fire cost puzzle 
puzzle, but there are limits in this case, literally, because the amount of the insurance payout is determined by the terms and limits of the policy itself. Generally, homeowners policies don't cover limits beyond one to $2 million unless the homeowner has paid for more coverage. And every policy carries exclusions that prevent the insurance company from having to pay out if the situation falls under one of those scenarios covered by the exclusion. And whenever you have this much property destruction at exactly the same time, the insurance industry is notorious for doing whatever it can to avoid paying out. As one of my former law partners used to say, the only thing an insurance policy is good for is getting the right to sue your insurance company. Already these wildfires in Oregon and California are causing huge losses in the insurance industry. And a few years ago, back in 2018, the campfire fire was the costliest wildfire in California history, causing more than 14,000 structures to be destroyed. And the insurance industry had losses of over $14 billion. The scale of those losses, in other words, the insurance companies had to pay out billions of dollars to the people that bought insurance from them, prompted reinsurance companies to step back. Now, reinsurance is insurance purchased by insurance companies that are offloading some of the financial risks of a major catastrophe. The availability of reinsurance enables better known primary carers, such as farmers and State Farm, to keep riding coverage in areas that are most likely to experience wildfires. Now, while primary insurance companies generally face tons of regulations that uh, prevent them from raising prices for high risk areas, reinsurance companies generally are not subject to rate regulation by the California Department of Insurance. As a result, reinsurance rates are skyrocketing by as much as 70%. So since insurers can't raise homeowners insurance rates because of state regulations to match the actual price of the things that they're having to pay out because of the wildfires, generally because of state regulations, insurance companies have reduced the number of policies that they underwrite. And some people living in rural California now have properties that are effectively uninsurable. So while many homeowners in affected areas may be able to get an insurance payout this year, effectively the insurance companies may leave the area entirely because it's too risky and the housing markets in these areas may tank because no one's gonna buy an uninsured house, especially in an area that's going to be facing wildfires year after year. People love to dunk on insurance companies, myself included, but if it becomes too costly to provide that insurance, the insurance company will just simply leave the market entirely. But with insurance companies increasingly refusing to provide coverage for these kinds of areas, that might mean that the federal government, in other words, taxpayers, are going to have to pick up the bill. And when it comes to the cost of fighting the fires, the federal government has stepped in to cover some of those costs. The Trump administration issued a major disaster declaration for California wildfires, which opened up the gates for federal funding to be funneled into recovery efforts. Funding through the declarations covers up to 75% of the costs incurred by California for removing debris, conducting emergency activities, activities, providing transitional sheltering, and presumably raking the forests, as the president has told us that we should be doing. I was with the president of Finland, and he said, we have uh, a much different, we're a forest nation. He called it a forest nation. And they spent a lot of time on raking and cleaning and doing things, and they don't have any problem. And when it is, it's a very small problem. You gotta take care of the floors, you know, the floors of the forests, very important. Federal funding is also available on a cost-sharing basis for hazard mitigation measures statewide. Now, the federal government has spent about $1.58 billion on fire suppression in 2019, and this is more than triple the amount allocated in 2018. Unfortunately, some of the money that was allocated to fight fires was shifted from fire prevention activities, and the West Coast fires are often politicized in a really ugly way. Now, there is a source of quasi-governmental entities that might provide compensation, and that would be the utility companies. Now, most experts say that extreme weather conditions that lead to fires are caused by climate change, but the laws that we have on the books just haven't caught up with the scale of these massive fires. This is a big problem for state and local governments, which are left footing the bill for the cost of fire suppression and cleanup. And sometimes there's an easy, wealthy target for the state to go after. For example, California's Department of Forestry and Fire Protection determined that 12 devastating fires that struck Northern California California in 2017 were the result of trees coming into contact with power lines or other failures by the utility company PG&E. And thanks to a policy known as inverse condemnation, the utility has to pay those damages, which the company believes will be over $10 billion. And even if the company is 
found to be not negligent. Inverse condemnation is a legal doctrine that holds utility companies like PG&E, Pacific Gas and Electric to a strict liability standard. Under strict liability, it doesn't matter if a fire starts by accident or negligence. If it happens on the company's equipment, then the utility is responsible for those damages. The California court decisions in the 1960s and 70s allowed the state to use inverse condemnation to hold utilities liable. For many years, the utility companies could just handle the cost by increasing the rates charged to consumers. But in 2017, the California California Public Utilities Commission turned down requests by SDG&E for $379 million in cost reimbursements for the 2007 wildfires sparked by their lines. Now power companies may be on the hook for actual costs without electricity hikes. And how they're going to do that is anyone's guess. PG&E filed for bankruptcy protection. It argued that the disallowance amounted to a violation of the takings clause of the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution and the California Constitution. The legal theory is that even though the state did not take any PG&E property, applying inverse condemnation to the company effectively transfers the company to the state without just compensation or any compensation at all. And the company argued that if it was allowed to pass the costs to consumers through increased utility rates, inverse condemnation would be constitutional. But a federal bankruptcy court rejected this argument and the case is on appeal uh, in front of the California Supreme Court. Which takes us to the next group of people who are likely to face some liability. And that is of course the tort liability of individuals. A tort is a wrong committed by a person that ends up causing harm to someone or something else. The tort at stake in wildfire cases is most likely negligence. And Black's Law Dictionary defines negligence as the failure to exercise a standard of care that a reasonably prudent person would have exercised in a similar situation. And there are four elements in a negligence claim. Duty, a breach of that duty, injury, and causation. Now the two elements that I wanna highlight in a wildfire negligence case is the duty of care and causation because damages are pretty obvious here. Now the duty of care is based on what a reasonable person in the same or similar circumstance would do. It's an objective test based on what a reasonable person would have done in the same or similar circumstances. The circumstances of the El Dorado gender reveal party help us to define whether a person acted reasonably or negligently. Did the people detonate explosives in their backyard near a pool or were they in an area with high flammable dry foliage? What was the weather like? Was it hot and dry or cool and rainy? Had local authorities warned people that conditions were dangerous and could potentially lead to fire? The facts determine whether people acted reasonably or like idiots. I mean, acted reasonably. And as I've said before, if you ask a lawyer anything, the answer is almost always it depends. And I try not to take a stand on most things, but I will go out on a limb and say that if you are detonating a bomb in front of a bunch of dry grass on a hundred degree day, that's probably negligence. But that takes us to the second element of negligence that's uh, at play here, and that's causation. Now there are two types of negligent causation. There's actual cause and proximate cause. And actual cause is sometimes referred to as cause in fact. It means that but for the negligent act or the omission by the defendant, the plaintiff would not have been harmed. This is known as the but-for test. For example, if a couple detonates a bomb in front of a bunch of dry grass on an incredibly hot, dry day, and that grass catches fire and sets their neighbor's house on fire, then it's clear that the but-for test is made. That but for the bomb going off and the fire consuming the house, the house wouldn't have been damaged. But the second type of negligent causation is called proximate cause. And proximate cause requires that the natural, direct, and uninterrupted consequence of a negligent act or omission causes the plaintiff's injury. For example, the El Dorado couple's actions did start a huge fire, but where does their liability end? What if once the fire had started, Joe Rogan, seeing the fire spreading, decided that he wanted to create a copycat fire and blame liberal activists for setting fires. I'm a little salty because Joe Rogan is blaming liberal activists for the fires, which is insane. I said something on the podcast with Douglas Murray about people getting arrested for uh, lighting fires. You know, air quote activists. And uh, I got duped. Obviously the El Dorado couple's actions are a but for cause. Seeing the fires led Joe Rogan to start a copycat fire, but it's hard to say that their actions were the proximate cause of the second fire spreading and causing damage. And extending this hypothetical even further, what happens if the first fire and the second fire combine to form a super fire and then damage other property? Who's then responsible for the damages caused by the combined fire? It's hard to say. That's the problem of proving proximate cause. But back to the real world, I think a jury could be persuaded that the El Dorado couple acted negligently and caused property damages, but collecting many billions of dollars from that couple would be a daunting, if not impossible, task. They're not Jeff Bezos. 
But just because someone might be judgment proof and can't afford the billions of dollars of property damage doesn't mean that they're going to escape all penalties. And there are other options for local government. With fires on the rise in the West, local and state governments have started going after people for starting fires. In Oregon, for example, two men were billed for starting a fire that burned 26,000 acres over the course of a month. And the men were billed for $37 million in damages. They both used lawnmowers to mow grass during the daytime, which was prohibited at the time because the conditions were so hot and dry that they could cause a fire which they did. But under Oregon law, the men could only be fined in accordance with civil penalties. They were each fined $550 each for a fire that cost the state at least $37 million to suppress. But California law provides an additional way to penalize reckless property owners. For example, in 2016, the US Forest Service sued a California property owner seeking almost $25 million in compensation for the fire that burned 15,000 acres of federal lands in San Bernardino National Forest. Investigators determined that the fire ignited in a plastic electrical junction box that wasn't properly sealed. An electrical discharge inside the box shot sparks onto dry ground vegetation, which sparked a mountain fire. The theories of liability included negligence, trespass by fire, and violations of California's Health and Safety Code Section 13001, which allows the state to pass the cost of fire suppression to any person who negligently sparks a fire. Obviously, the plaintiff is unlikely to get $25 million, but the suit allows the government to negotiate with an insurance company provided the property was insured and sends a message that they hope will deter others from similar conduct. Of course, if the civil fines and lawsuits aren't enough, a person can be prosecuted criminally as well. A person can be prosecuted for reckless or extremely negligent conduct, the kind of thing that we would normally call an accident. Under California Penal Code Section 452, it's a crime for a person to recklessly set a fire or burn any structure, forest, land, or property. California Penal Code Section 452 makes it a crime for a person to recklessly set a fire or to burn any structure, forest, land, or property. A person acts recklessly if the the person is aware that their actions could present a substantial and unjustifiable risk of causing a fire. The person ignores that risk, and ignoring the risk is a gross deviation from how a reasonable person would act in the same situation. A reckless action is a higher standard than mistakes or even negligence. Negligent acts include things like forgetting to turn off the burner on a stove. This alone won't subject someone to a reckless burning charge. However, acting with complete disregard for safety may. So for example, if you were trying to heat up a can of gasoline on the stove, that might qualify as recklessness. You didn't intend for a fire to start, but you should know that if you're heating up gasoline on a stove on an open flame, a fire may result uh, from that. And basic reckless burning of personal property under Penal Code Section 452 is a misdemeanor with a maximum penalty of six months in jail and a fine up to $1,000. But if the reckless burning results in a burned structure or forest land, or if it causes great bodily injury, then the crime may be prosecuted as either a misdemeanor or a felony. And that's what happened to William Rupp, who served two years in prison for recklessly causing the Lake Shasta fire in 2008. The 56 year old was accused of intentionally ignoring warnings of a potential fire hazard by cutting the grass on his rural property on an extremely dry day when temperatures were about 106 degrees. A mower blade struck a rock, sparked and ignited the fire, which burned 86 rural homes at around 1.30 p.m. Prosecutors said Rupp ignored warnings not to mow from neighbors and public service spots on TV and told one person who questioned him to go to hell. And a similar situation happened in Arizona when an off-duty border patrol agent was ordered to pay $220,000 in restitution after he started a 47,000 acre wildfire at a gender reveal party. Again, with the friggin' gender reveal parties. In that case, Dennis Dickey pleaded guilty to the misdemeanor charge of causing a fire without a permit after he caused the April 2017 sawmill fire in Arizona. Dickey reportedly shot a target containing tannonite, which is an explosive substance designed to detonate when shot by a high velocity firearm, and colored powder that would reveal the baby's gender at the party. Tannonite has reportedly been linked to past wildfires and featured prominently in Tiger King. Are you ready for this? Bom, 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 bom. Oh, hell. Dickey, of course, claimed it was a complete accident and that he immediately contacted authorities. And that's probably true, but the problem with claiming that it's a complete accident is that there were 40 mile an hour winds that day in the desert in an area that had already experienced uh, drought conditions. And you would think that a reasonable person would know that a high explosive in dry grass with fast winds is likely to cause a really big fire. 
But if you're throwing a gender reveal party with explosives, then you're probably an idiot and you need to spend some time learning how to not be an idiot. And the best place to learn anything is Skillshare. And one of the best classes is Thomas Frank's class on real productivity, how to build habits that last. And I'll bet one of the keys to productivity is not throwing a stupid gender reveal party. But let me ask him. Hey, Thomas. Stop throwing gender reveal parties. And just a thought, maybe. Stop starting fires too. Yep. Thomas is a smart guy, and his short one hour class on Skillshare will help you stick to your habits even after the initial novelty period wears off. He focuses on strengthening your internal self-discipline, assisting that self-discipline with smart external systems that keep you on track, and improving those habits over time with regular reflection. Over 45,000 people have already taken Thomas Frank's class on Skillshare, and not one of them has started a forest fire. Skillshare, as you know, is an online learning community that has tens of thousands of classes on everything, like illustration, creative writing, music, and programming. Productivity. The first 1,000 Legal Eagles will get two free months of Skillshare Premium when you click on the link in the description. Plus, after that trial ends, Skillshare is way more affordable than most online learning platforms, with plans starting at less than $10 per month. Plus, clicking on that link in the description really helps out this channel. And it's way cheaper than paying $37 million for damage from a forest fire. So just click on the link below and get two free months of Skillshare. So, do you agree with my analysis? Should we jail all people that throw gender reveal parties or just those that start forest fires? Leave your objections in the comments and check out this playlist over here with all of my other real law reviews where I talk about all of the things that are in the legal news from the Trump administration to COVID, you name it, it's all here. So click on this playlist and I'll see you in court.